Hi, uh, my name is Ian Clark. I'm a trip leader at the Portland State Outdoor Program. Uh, welcome to today's workshop. Uh, today we're talking about fire making. Uh, myself and a coworker of mine have prepared a short presentation. Um, I expect it to run between 20 and 40 minutes, somewhere in there, um, to just go over all the topics um, that we wanted to share in this. Um, so without further ado, I'll go into a few of the different things that we covering today. Um, the subcaption of this is techniques and tools. Um, so we'll go a little bit more into what we're what we're talking about. So we're going to be talking about building the fire, the structure, fuel, and uh, how to build something called the tinder bundle and what that is. Um, strike style fire starters, bow drill fire starting, and uh, other modern techniques of fire starting, uh, as well as followed by some basic fire safety, which maybe we should have started with that, but oh well, um, here we are. So uh, basically, if I were to kind of summarize what this looks like, um, fire strike and bow drill fire starting are kind of more hobbyist uh, niche ways of doing fire starting, while you know valuable skills if you're someone who likes to spend a lot of time in the outdoors to know how to do uh, and to know the concepts of these come from so you can be in a position to you know make fire. I will say that something like having a big lighter or matches are um, probably the uh, most practical ways of starting fire, um, assuming that you're you know going into the wilderness prepared and stuff. So I hope that I can share information with you today that will help you um, be in a position where you can you know have the skills to build fire, uh, but understand that you know strike fire starters and uh, bow drilling are not necessarily the most practical way to go about it, uh, even though that's what we'll be talking about for the majority of the time. Um, kind of a niche hobbyist thing, something if you're interested in, uh, hopefully this can be a, a jumping off point. I felt like that was kind of important to preface, like that's what this is gonna be. Um, and with that, I'm gonna proceed forward into fire structure. Uh, so before we get into the cool fire starting techniques, uh, an important part of fire making is fire structure. So people have their own ideas about this, um, there are a lot more ways than what are just being shown right here. Um, a lot of niche techniques used by various groups throughout the world, but uh, two really common ones are this, uh, this pyramid kind of structure that you see on the left or cone structure, um, and what's called the log cabin method of building a fire uh, on the right. So I'll just briefly delve into a little bit what each of these are. Um, on the left, it's essentially building up a cone, uh, starting from the inside with the smallest kindling material or the smallest fuel material that you have, uh, and building up to the bigger stuff on the outside. Uh, this is a great technique because it's really efficient, um, and it makes a very efficient use of the heat uh, that is going upward from the fire and radiating outward as well. Uh, so the fire starts in the middle, and if you've got enough fuel for a fire and you've got enough heat to start a fire, uh, this is a really efficient way to do it. The only problem with this is it's kind of a pain to set up. Uh, you can see, you know, if one of those big logs fell over, uh, this entire thing could come crumbling to the ground. And if your fire has already started, you know, eventually that will happen once, you know, stuff starts to lose its structural, structural integrity uh, from being on fire. Um, so that's kind of the only problem with this, but you gain efficiency for that. So a bit of a trade-off with the log cabin technique. Um, it's a little bit more reliable in terms of um, standing up, but in my experience, uh, the things that this tech, while it's reliable, this technique suffers from um, not being nearly as efficient with that with the fire. So, you know, you end up needing to pile a good amount of fuel into the middle, and so you want to make sure that you don't use all your fuel building this log cabin because it's not a super efficient way to keep the heat, unless it's like roaring. Um, a small fire is likely to, to go out in there. So you would want to make sure that if you use this technique, you've got enough fuel to kind of keep putting stuff in. Whereas with this um, cone technique on the left, this will just burn. Um, and you won't have to necessarily add more fuel, although you would probably want to if you wanted to have a reasonably long fire. Um, yeah, so these are the two fire structures that I wanted to talk about. And I'm just going to move on from that. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't really take questions about them, but you can look at um, more fire building techniques online if you're curious about that. 
appropriate fuel for these kinds of fires. Uh, in a lot of situations, you know, you might just have your pre-cut, uh, you know, or just cut or cured wood even um, from, say, if you're at a camp spot, like a camping location. Um, that's, you know, having that or bringing that is generally the most uh, leave no trace way to go about building a fire. But if you find yourself in a situation where you're building a fire otherwise, you're looking for dry material. Uh, if there's nothing dry, you want something that's uh, relatively, you know, it looks like it's been on the ground for not too long. And you want to be able to split it so that you can access the interior, which for a relatively, relatively young piece of wood um, will still be, uh, you know, have enough resin and uh, not too much water such that hopefully that's usable. Um, splinters of deadfall, you know, if you have a tree crack, it leaves a lot of you know splinters at that where that break happens, and so a lot of the time there are pieces in there that are protected from the rain, and that's a really good place to look if you're if you find yourself in need of fuel for a fire, um, in that kind of area can be a really good place to look for that even if it's like the rainy season. And you would want to use that really dry wood as a, as kindling kind of to start your fire. So, talk more about some of this in a bit, but leaving that there for now. So a couple of the um, hobbyist ways of starting fires or, you know, last ditch crazy survival um, ways of starting fires, the uh, strike fire starter and the bow drill technique require kind of another part, another element to uh, those built fires that we were looking at earlier. So this is the tinder bundle. Uh, so the tinder bundle is essentially a little nest thing uh, of highly flammable material or flammable material that's like kind of pulverized to be, uh, you know, shredded. So it's got really high surface area. Uh, some great materials for this are birch bark scrapings. That's a, a, a favorite one or shreds. Uh, sage bark, dry sage bark is good. Um, dried grass, other bark shreds. Uh, there are a number of other materials that you can find to make this out of. Uh, it's kind of can be difficult to find something appropriate in a wet environment. Um, but anything that you can kind of shred up in, in a wet environment, birch bark might be your best bet, is very resinous. So even if it's a bit damp, that can be made to work. Uh, and so this is relevant to the bow drill and the strike fire technique, uh, or the strike fire starter techniques most, most heavily. Uh, so the technique for making this, once you've got your material, you know, if you've got bark, shred it up. And once you've got it kind of in a shredded or some kind of state like that, uh, just take it in your hands and you want to rub it together to rough up all the surfaces, uh, get like little fibrous parts falling apart. This is especially true for this, the sage bark. Uh, and then you want to, especially if you're doing the bow drill technique, you want to kind of make a little indent in it, an impression. Uh, as you can kind of see in this picture, there's a bit of an indent there where they've dropped this ember. Uh, this is, looks like it's from the bow drill technique. Um, and so the idea behind that depression is that that's kind of a small area where the heat can gather in a more efficient way without necessarily a draft of wind uh, directly hitting it as much. So it's kind of a, it's a nest to kindle that uh, little fire, like a bird might kindle its young, you know, um, to protect it from the environment. So looking back at those photos, um, if you were doing one of these techniques that would need this nest, say for example, for the pyramid one or the, the cone, uh, you would want to have that, you want to have all this, these small pieces near the bottom, small, really dry pieces in the, in that like uh, center region of the cone. And you would want to start that nest burning separately from this with your, with whatever technique you're using and then put it in there. That's especially true for the bow drill technique. That's what you have to do. With a strike fire starter, you could have that nest in there already. Uh, and that could that could work. Yeah. Uh, and then for the uh, log cabin style, you would want to start with, I would, I would recommend the, the pyramid or cone one probably for these techniques. But you would want to start with it in a corner next to some of those pieces of wood and kind of uh, in an area that's kind of blocking the wind and stuff like that, because this is kind of a, it's a delicate process once you've got that um, nest going. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. We're getting into strike fire starters now that we've got kind of that base uh, that we can talk about these. So one of the original strike fire starters that you may have heard of is flint and steel. Um, this is a traditional way of starting fire that's been used for millennia by people. 
uh, perhaps not millennia, I don't really know. Steel's not that old, but something akin to this uh, has been used for a very long time. Uh, essentially, nowadays, instead of flint and steel, we use uh, steel and ferrocerium. Ferrocerium is a pyrophoric alloy, uh, which means it's an alloy that basically when it's scraped off, uh, it generates enough heat to uh, have an incendiary effect for the, the small scrapings of it. So when basically when you use the steel to scrape the uh, ferrocerium off of the rod, a ferrocerium, um, those little pieces of ferrocerium that come off, which is what those sparks are, um, those are at about up to 3000 degrees Celsius, maybe less in a, you know, outdoor environment. And that's, that's kind of the maximum, but uh, basically they can be very hot. And so uh, with flint and steel, the steel was uh, the pyrophoric, the pyrophoric material that was being scraped off by the very hard flint. Uh, and now that we've got ferrocerium at our disposal, uh, we can make really hard steel and use that steel to scrape off the ferrocerium. Uh, the pyrophoric alloy, uh, which will then, you know, create sparks. So uh, we've got a couple of pictures of these, uh, specifically on the left, that is simply a ferrocerium rod and a steel striker. So that's the most simple kind of this technology, uh, aside from flint and steel, which maybe is a little more simple, but um, that's the most straightforward application. And so essentially, you would simply use that scraper or you know a key or whatever uh, to scrape the ferrocerium rod, which is what that uh, the rod there is made out of, uh, and that would create sparks that you could use to light your uh, tinder bundle or your uh, your nest thing that you've made, and that's the idea behind that technique. And on the right, we've got something a little bit more. Uh, it's a little bit more of an advanced. Uh, piece um, in the sense that it has magnesium. So essentially this big, uh, the bulk of this bigger, larger piece is magnesium. You can scrape it. So the magnesium is meant to be scraped off into a small pile uh, that can be onto your nest. Or if you're using magnesium, you may be able to get away without making a nest. Um, but the idea is that the magnesium is not pyrophoric, but it is uh, burns at a very high temperature once it's ignited. Um, and so you can scrape the magnesium into a pile and then the other strip here that you see, this darker strip, is ferrocerium or a very similar material. Uh, and so then you would scrape sparks off of that onto the magnesium. Um, and then you would have something that's burning even hotter than the ferrocerium and potentially a larger amount of it. Um, and so you could use that with just kindling, if you had very small kindling, um, that could be used to start a fire even if you didn't have a perfect kind of nest thing that you built. So these are available. That would be um, a, mag you know, a magnesium strip fire starter. There are various models of them. Um, some ferrocerium rod fire starters just like this are incorrectly labeled or marketed as magnesium fire starters. So just making sure that if you're purchasing one and you want magnesium, uh, you can see that there are two different kinds of material uh, in this, in the part that you're going to be striking. So like here, or it could be like this one on the left, but with a little magnesium strip on it. Um, I've seen those as well. So yeah, and the technique for using these, um, we just talked about the magnesium one, but standard technique. Sorry, I don't have one with me right now. It's in a different location. Um, but holding it by that, this little piece that is designed, designed to be held and then striking at your nest with a good amount of force. Uh, and you generally need to remove this like darker outer coat. It should be a lighter colored alloy underneath. This is just paint. Um, so removing that and then scraping that with a good amount of force because that force is also what's generating the friction, uh, which is creating some of the heat. So at least beginning creating the heat that initiates the reaction. So harder, you get more material um, and more sparks. So. And these generally have somewhere between 3,000 and 12,000 strikes in them uh, of just, you know, standard strength. So, it, and that can be labeled on the piece that you buy. All right, moving on. The bow drill. Um, so these slides are put together by my coworker. Her name is Becky. She's great at this stuff. Uh, I actually learned to do uh, 
busting or bow drilling um, from her. So I just want to shout out for putting these slides together. Really appreciate that. Um, and I'll speak through them, talk about what bow drilling or busting is. Um, to be clear, it's kind of an enthusiast or you know hobbyist way of making fire. It's it's a hobby for folks, uh, and it's it's pretty fun, uh, really satisfying to get. It could also be seen as a practical skill if you're someone who spends a lot of time in the backcountry. You know, the idea behind this is that it's it uses you know natural materials for the most for the most part, aside from maybe a knife to put it all together, but it uses natural materials to create a fire. Uh, so all you would really need is a knife and a paracord. Um, or some kind of twine to make this work or to make this uh, in pretty much any environment you could find woods that would be make this possible. So that's kind of the idea behind it. And then we'll talk a little bit about what uh, is actually what it actually looks like to actually do it. So um, first of all, anatomy. We're going to go to the next slide and then we're going to come back here. The anatomy of the bow drill, there are several components. Uh, the first one is the uh, dowel. So this big stick, or the, or the spindle is what it's more commonly called, my apologies. Um, this big stick in the center here uh, would be made out of some kind of softer wood. Um, and it is the part that actually, uh, uh, at least half of the part that uh, creates the heat. And so that's the piece that's getting spun really fast. And so all the other things are kind of based around this and the baseboard. Um, so that's one component. Um, and the baseboard is probably the next most important component. That is essentially, uh, as it says here, drill the hole with notch. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be drilled. It can be um, carved out with a knife, but essentially you need the baseboard to have a small hole in it that the spindle can be stuck into. And the spindle is sharpened on the bottom so that it can kind of fit into a hole that's you know, this kind of shape. And then um, you want a notch in the side, as you can see in this photo, uh, a small notch on the side, a little bit smaller probably than what it looks like in this photo. And the idea behind that notch is that it will give space for uh, the ember, hot embers to come out. Um, once you get an ember, you can kind of knock it out onto your nest. Um, and that's the idea behind that, uh, that little notch. So, um, the next component is the bow. So the bow is a piece of, you know, some kind of highly ductile um, wood material. Willow is a great one. There are a lot of other ones that will work just fine. But essentially, its purpose is to hold um, this, the, um, the yarn or, you know, the twine or paracord, whatever kind of rope thing you're using. Uh, it's to hold that under tension. Uh, because you need that to be under tension for it to actually uh, move the, the spindle, to rotate the spindle with good force. Uh, so with the bow like that, moving it back and forth, uh, it will create rotating, uh, you know, torque on the, on the spindle, which is what creates that friction. But you also need, in order to create that friction, uh, you need force downward. And so if you were to push downward on the spindle with your hand, uh, you'd be drilling a hole in your hand and you wouldn't be having fun with that. So you need um, a rock or some kind of hard piece, which is called a hand piece, to go on top and push it down. Ideally, this rock or a seashell or whatever has a kind of concave nature so that it can hold um, the spindle in place while you use that bow to have the spindle drill. So uh, those are kind of all the components uh, that make, it, make up the bow drill setup. And you can kind of see those all at play here. So this person has their baseboard at the bottom. You can see a small notch drilled into it. They've got this spindle. I'm not sure exactly what kind of wood this is, but you can see it's kind of brought to a taper near the bottom, going into that little hole. And so they're using the bow uh, to create that torque on it uh, with the twine wrapped around. And they've got a hand piece of some kind. It appears to be possibly a bone in this case. Um, <clears throat> there are you know, many different things which could serve the purpose of that handpiece. But uh, so that's the basic anatomy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more. Just briefly, I'm going to talk about the technique. Um, but you can, you should look up a video online. Unfortunately, I don't have the materials on me right now to do a live demonstration. But just look up a short, you know, two-minute YouTube video online. You'll see someone doing it. But essentially, it's um, 
keeping the, the baseboard, that bottom piece, held down with the foot uh, or, you know, or a knee or whatever while you apply pressure to the spindle in the hole, um, in the drilled or, you know, carved out hole and start pulling the, uh, the saw back and forth um, while applying pressure downward. And so that is the essential motion that creates friction and ends up creating, uh, you know, lots of wood dust and lots of heat and can create a burning ember uh, in that little hole that he's got uh, in the baseboard. And so I've done this technique before uh, with just a little bit of practice to kind of get it down. It is possible um, to create that ember and to start a fire, excuse me, if you've got, um, you know, that little mess prepared to hold the ember and to bring that, you know, make more energy out of that little tiny hot thing. And that what that ember looks like is something like this. So that's a, a reasonably sized ember uh, and that will um, ignite this. Uh, but the, the key to making it ignite it, aside from just having it in there, is to give it um, that little extra incentive of blowing on it. So um, once you get that into the nest, you want to blow on it uh, and have that air, you know, running, increase the heat uh, after it's been sitting there for a little bit, and uh, hopefully get yourself a fire started uh, in your little nest. So there are a lot of different woods uh, that can be used for this. Essentially, uh, for the baseboard, um, you want a wood that's about as soft as you can get it. Um, and for the spindle, you want something um, somewhere between uh, soft and in between. Um, the idea being that a harder wood just makes it more difficult to create the, that dust and um, to create that heat from friction. And so all the woods listed here are basically um, softer woods, cedar, redwood, cypress, yucca, cottonwood, willow, basewood. Um, so that doesn't mean that it's impossible to make, uh, make this work with harder woods, but it is true that it's uh, significantly easier with softer woods or soft woods. So that's the idea behind this. Um, and that's about as much detail as I can provide on it, frankly, as someone who's only done it a few times. Uh, I can say that, you know, if you think you can throw together a setup like this, maybe with a little bit more instruction online um, and, you know, finding pieces of softer wood from your area, cedar's pretty populous um, in many locations. Cedar's a good one. Um, it's really practice that makes this come to life. So um, if you're having trouble getting it to work, maybe a little bit more forced, but maybe looking at um, what kind of materials you're using too, and trying to get those to be soft materials. So yeah, and then uh, the last note on this slide is to compare it to the hand drill. You may have seen folks do this. Um, it's basically the same thing, but instead of using a bow, you use your hands to get that spindle to move enough to get it really hot. Um, it's difficult. That's a difficult thing to do is my understanding. Uh, it generally results in your hands being a little bit messed up um, from just all that friction on your hands, uh, especially if you don't have a perfect spindle, you know, this is a picture, it seems like, of a near-perfect spindle. Uh, although that's probably partially just because of the rotation of it, but you know, a lot of spindles might have slight imperfections. Um, and doing that and having to press down at the same time, uh, it's just a very difficult thing to do. So that's why the bow drill technique is popular. Um, it's just a bit more viable in most situations. All right, so, excuse me, why the bow drill? Uh, less reliance on modern tools. You could potentially, you know, you have the tools to make this if you uh, have just a knife, you know, and you're in the wilderness um, and hopefully some cordage, you know, even a shoelace uh, would suffice. And so uh, that's, that's kind of one perk of having this skill set is that you don't, you're not reliant on anything other than, you know, a sharp tool to prepare all the different components. So. The other note on the right, uh, it's difficult, you know, it needs some practice uh, to get good at it. So really it's more of a, you know, a niche hobbyist uh, way to start fire. It's not, you shouldn't head into the woods with just your knife uh, and a shoelace and think, you know, this is how I'm gonna start fire. You definitely would wanna, you know, have some more modern techniques to start fire uh, and then use this as kind of a, as a hobbyist approach. Modern techniques uh, being something like a Bic lighter and matches uh, there are some other tools uh, 
that are basically possibly analogous to like a striker, um, but so maybe a little bit more, a little bit better. Um, but these are some modern tools that you can use. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about these. My personal choice is the Bic lighter. Um, it has some pros and cons, but uh, matches are also kind of tried and true for a lot of people. I personally would say that they're probably not quite as good as the Bic lighter. Uh, with the Bic you can, or you know, just one of these other lighters, uh, you can light a larger piece without problems, but I would also recommend bringing multiple. I always bring a Bic and matches uh, when I need to start fires anywhere um, or have a fire source because um, having backups is always good. And you would always want, when you're using these modern techniques, you really want a waterproof container of some kind, you know, Ziploc bag, multiple Ziploc bags uh, to keep them watertight because if they get wet, then you may not have a way to make fire. Uh, true for the matches and true for the Bic. Um, so the one kind of drawback of the Bic that I've mentioned here is that it's susceptible to failure by wetness. Um, I've seen a professional trip leader uh, go through several, you know, these Bic type lighters like these um, in wet conditions and not be able to successfully light even, you know, a stove because if it's oriented like this and water gets in here to the top, it won't work again until it's dry essentially, um, because that water can just dampen the uh, spark making components. So uh, that's a pretty major drawback um, and it's something to be avoided by keeping it in a watertight uh, container. Advantages, uh, many uses and uh, reliable in dry conditions and usable even in windy and wet conditions. Um, so there's a technique demonstration here for using a BIC uh, if it's raining out you definitely want to try to keep it in a watertight container as much as possible. But um, there is a technique that can be used to use a big lighter actively while it's raining. Um, you know, you would want to, you know, cover it as much as you can and try to get over it. But um, since water going into the top is the problem, um, the technique would be to use the lighter upside down. And I'm having trouble with the camera angle here, but essentially you would want to have it kind of at this angle with the, um, Part that produces the flame at the top and your finger at the bottom, not the other way around. Um, so you can use it in that manner. And that will allow you to use a big lighter even um, in wet conditions. So that's a pretty important tip that not a lot of people, uh, you know, intuitively understand. Uh, and that, I would say that that's, that's the way that I really use my big lighters mostly. Um, yeah because it's just, you know, even if, if it's just sprinkling a little bit, your Bic lighter can stop working. Another little pro tip about these, um, in cold conditions, you may notice that the flame is uh, lesser. And you may notice that if the Bic gets warm, uh, the flame will be greater. And so that has to do with the gas um, that is inside of it. And uh, PV equals NRT. <laughs> Um, pressure times volume equals N something uh, times something times temperature. It's been too long since the chemistry, but uh, essentially, you know, higher pressure in the chamber if it's warmer. So keeping um, the bit close to your body in cold temperatures uh, can be a great way to um, keep it working it in a more optimal way. So that's my last big tip. Uh, a couple of finishing notes from this. Um, one, it's really important to have a backup fire starter. So today we were talking about, uh, you know, some hobbyist ways of doing fire starting. I think the strikers are super fun and cool. Um, and I think bow drill is a really, you know, interesting technique and a great hobby. A lot of people, you know, travel and explore various new places, um, you know, just in order to find some new woods for their bow drill kit, find some new, find a new spindle. Uh, find some new kindling uh, to make their make their little nest or a tinder bundle. Um, I think it's a great hobby, but if you're going into a situation where you need fire um, or you know a fire ignition source, you don't want to be relying on that. Uh, you want to be primarily relying on one of the modern techniques, that being you know Bic or lighters probably. Um, I mean, that being said, if you're, if you're good with a striker and you bring your own 
you know, nest material, which I would recommend doing if you're planning on doing these things. Um, potentially you, you know, you have the resources to start a fire fairly reliably somewhat. Um, so yeah, um, the difference between hobbyist and practical fire maker is kind of what I was just talking about there. And then safety is something I want to touch on. So basic fire safety, um, 15 feet from structures or flammable materials uh, where you're building your fire. Uh, keep water nearby to be able to extinguish it at any time. And uh, put out the campfire thoroughly before leaving the area. That's kind of a big one, and it's a there's a bit there's more to that than this. People have different approaches to it. I've heard um, you know outdoor uh, safety advocates say one thing, and firefighters say another, and um, people have different opinions on the right way to do this. One standard technique is uh, to let the fire burn out as much as you can uh, before you have to like leave it unattended, and uh, once you get to that point, to douse it in water mix it, mix the fire up so that you're spreading that heat around and then douse it in water again. Um, that can be a technique. You also want to check under rocks to make sure that there's no um, burning you know, embers under there. And you want to make sure that you haven't uh, got any roots right under there that have uh, started burning because that can be a way that uh, forest fires are started. So yeah, that's just some uh, fire safety basics as well as obeying fire restrictions. Um, one of the easiest times to make fires in the outdoors is uh, when there's lots of dry wood around, you know, in the summer when everything's been baking under the sun. Uh, it's really easy to just put a bunch of stuff together and make a fire, but odds are if you're on any kind of public land whatsoever, um, there's going to be a fire ban at those times because that's when you're going to, you know, start a forest fire by accident. Um, and so obeying forest fire restrictions is a really important part of, uh, you know, being a good steward of the outdoors when you're out there. Yeah, uh, and that's that's a reason that, you know, being careful with fire is one of the seven principles of the Leave, of the leave No Trace principles set. Um, so pretty important to touch on that.